The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. And I'm Heather Berlin. Science Goes to the Movies is about movies, TV shows, pop culture, and of course, science. Today we're going to look at Cinemax's turn of the century medical drama, The Nick. Directed by Steven Soderbergh and starring Clive Owen, the series is set in a fictionalized version of the real Knickerbocker Hospital located on 131st Street in Harlem, which served uptown New York under various names from 1862 until 1979. In 1900, the Knickerbocker Hospital was a cutting edge medical facility. And given their staggeringly high mortality rates, grotesque racism and sexism, and limited understanding of sanitation, that is a terrifying thought. I will not stop pushing forward into a hopeful future. And with every blow I land, every extra year I give to a patient, that at the very least, something has been won. Our guest today is Dr. Jill Barganetti, professor of biological sciences at the City University of New York at Hunter College, and her lab is located in the Belfer Research Building. Dr. Barganetti's research team is using genetically engineered tools to decrease the expression of oncogenes involved in the formation of different subtypes of breast cancer. The NIC shows us what life would be like before significant medical discoveries. It also shows us life before feminism, life with rampant racism. Actor Andre Holland plays Algernon Edwards, a brilliant surgeon with innovative ideas about medicine. Dr. Edwards' advancement in America is blocked at every turn. Okay, a, a question for both of you. Are sexism and racism the, the, the key enemies to science? Race is a social construct. Race is not a biological concept. And we still tend to think about race where we say this is a disease that affects a certain race. But really, we are all part of the human race, and the genetic construct is such that we should be looking at the genes of human beings and not thinking that there are genes specific to one race. And so we're still Especially having, as our populations become more and more multiracial. Exactly. Um, what's called admixture. Um, when we start to think about really what are the genes that people are carrying and this, this racial construct then setting us up to think that we have these different races. And it just isn't so. And so when we talk about are we still a little backward, I think at some point we're going to get to a place where we won't be discussing race in this way. And until we pass that, we haven't reached the plateau where we need to be in order for race not to be a problem in a medical or scientific concept. I have to add just a small historically correct side note to the discussion. The NIC portrays an all-white institution slowly opening its doors to black doctors. But in real life, that's not how hospitals became integrated. The first racially integrated staff hospital was built from the ground up by a black doctor pioneering cardiac surgeon Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. That was in Chicago in 1891. What the Nick does get right, though, is the turn-of-the-century explosion of medical advances. The barbaric medical practices and staggering Civil War casualties pushed medicine to create better sanitation and a better understanding of microbes. Jill, Science and, and medicine currently seems to be undergoing the same kind of massive medical ad advancements and innovations as we see in the turn of the last century in the NIC. What's causing that? Why, are we in kind of a I think new we're in era? a genetic 
revolution. Um, so with the sequencing of the human genome, it moved science along tremendously, and also the discovery of DNA. And so we are at a place where we're ready to make a number of new breakthroughs, and also that sequencing has become much less expensive, but it needs to become even um, cheaper. So I think that that is pushing things along, and I think we're going to see incredible breakthroughs that have to do with the genomic revolution. How do we get from research to bedside? To get from research to bedside, you need a lot of people helping to translate all of the information that's coming from the research and all of the information that's coming from the patient because you have to go both ways. It's not just a one directional flow. This is a flow that needs people on both sides talking and a lot of respect and I think we have to get past the egoism. Um, so we talked about racism and we talked about sexism but there's a lot of ego in medical practice and ego in research and we see that in the NIC where they're not sharing their data or they think they're going to be the best and they're going to get to the end and so people are not always working together the way they need to work together. It's so it's so discouraging and enlightening because you have you know Clive Owen's character Dr. Thackeray is such a dubious hero right he's brilliant mm -hmm. and he usually usually has the best intentions but he's also a horrible racist of his time and an addict and we want to think that doctors are our heroes. Now, granted, this is a drama, you know, this, this show is very dramatic, but is this, is this an accurate portrayal of, of lots of doctors? They're really, really flawed human beings? Flawed human beings, and you see where he doesn't want to work with the Jewish doctor, and he doesn't want to share his results, and they don't want to share their, you know, one wants to share, and the other doesn't want to share, and unless you're working together, it's very hard to make those breakthroughs. But I, mean, I really found that it was really, especially that like wanting to get all the credit for doing the research, it's still so true today. And it's, it's frustrating working in the research field where, you know, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of pressure to publish and, you know, to be the first author. I mean, I've seen people really like serious fights about who's going to be the first author on a paper, you know, to get the full Good credit. Good thing your last name begins with B. <laughs> yeah, if only it was alphabetical order, <laughs> that would be great. But, you know, it really still happens today. And I think the best models and, you know, kind of where we're moving towards is there are places like, like the Allen Brain Institute where it's completely funded by private money and it's just to hire people to all work together on this one project. So when a paper comes out, you know, there's just, there can be hundreds of names. And that's not the point. It's not any one individual of them are trying to create their own lab and their own domain and get their own funding. It's like here, you all have the funding, just work together and solve this problem. And, you know, if only that could happen at a larger scale, I think we'd make many more strides. I mean, I think something that's blocking our progress in, in research is this fact that we all have to have these individual kingdoms and domains and carve out a name for yourself when we might make better discoveries if we all work together. Okay, Jill, I have a question for you. In the first season of The Nick, a woman comes to the hospital and she has a fake nose because syphilis has ravaged and destroyed her real nose. What? Is that, is that even, is that a thing? Is that real? You know, I had to. I oh gosh, I can't, yeah. don't, don't, <laughs> that kind of, everybody <laughs> don't look. Okay, talk to oh, me, I'm not gonna is, look. Yeah, her, see. It is absolutely real and, and you know, before they understood about the bacteria, how to treat the bacteria, how the bacteria could ravage the body, how it could live in the body forever, just consistently, um, yeah. Um, we've come a long way in that regard. But thinking about the Tuskegee study where you could let people live and that's not so long ago and our government was willing to let these men live with syphilis, willing to let these men give syphilis to their spouse, and willing to let their children have syphilis because it had been transmitted to them in the womb. And now, you know, we recognize, wow, that was really a terrible ethical dilemma. And, and you know, you had to inform them, and they had to sue to get money back because they, they had been hurt by it. And they're fine once they got antibiotic treatment. But yes, I mean, that, that was a pretty horrific scene. I think we all agree that in the last 100 years, there have been great strides made in human sexuality and particularly female sexuality. Do you think 
feminism could have come to be without these scientific and medical advances? Well, I mean, feminism is, is an is a idea, right? So I think you, that could come regardless. I think the medical advances has helped. I mean, things like birth control and, you know, better reproductive medicine has allowed women to have the choice and the opportunity to have a career and, you know, to kind of choose when they want to have children. And that has given women a lot more freedom. So in that sense, it definitely has helped promote um, feminism. But, um, you know, I think it, it could perfectly well have come about without these advances, but they certainly helped. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would Especially agree. Especially with that. that with that example. Yeah. yeah. And even, I mean, I don't necessarily know that something like postpartum depression relates to feminism, but but postpartum depression is a, is a very is a very real thing. I have many friends who have experienced that, and to to understand, I know I know Jill, you talked about how um, medicine you hope will keep retreating away from seeing um, uh, things in terms of race, but there are certainly um, differences in medicine and treating men and women with with certain illnesses, right? And so probably any sort of scientific and medical discoveries that involve, aha, you know, this gives us a clue into female anatomy creates a, a better understanding of what women need to thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that it's understanding what is, you know, in terms of science, what's the hormonal makeup? What's going on? It's this, a similar thing, this personalized medicine. What's going yeah. on in this individual at that time in their life with this hormonal surge, with the cells that are doing certain things? How do we, how do we best affect this? And it's going to be environment and gene interactions, the whole picture. And there's even a field now um, in psychiatry on, on reproductive psychiatry which is really just focusing on all the, the, the mental health issues that are surrounding, you know, both be becoming pregnant, being pregnant, postpartum. That's cool. Yeah, and it's and a whole necessary. field emerging. It's a big deal, yeah. making yeah. another baby. So let's talk about science and communication. In the NIC, there's a storyline where Dr. Edwards, the, the black doctor, um, has published a paper on this, on this medical uh, breakthrough, but it's in French, and he is the only one who reads French, and his colleagues dismiss him and cannot read French, much to the uh, dismay of, of patients who need this medical discovery. I can't imagine there'd be a problem like that today. Uh, how, how is um, medicine and communication, how do they bump up against each other today? Oh, I think we could easily have similar problems. I think this takes us back to the, the whole concept of egoism in medicine. And so you might have a breakthrough where somebody really sees something, but other people aren't willing to appreciate it because of who the discovery came from. That's and appalling. I, 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 you know, what are there I are think? specific examples. Oh, no, there, yeah, I, there example? are specific examples. I mean, there are people who. Sorry, I got. Very, but there, there are people who um, still in this day and age. Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitism, um, especially in Europe. I mean, I, I did my graduate work in Europe, and they're boycotting papers and research done by uh, Israeli doctors. And I think that that's just such a detriment to science. And it's to make a political statement, um, you know, whether they're against, you know, whatever, you know, the, the existence of Israel, but to boycott, you know, research that's been done and boycott papers that's been done by doctors because they're Israeli, I, I find that appalling. And so I think that still occurs in this day and age. But, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the communication, we have, I mean, PubMed is huge. I mean, you, PubMed is this sort of online library of most medical journals. But, you know, still, in order to get access to a lot of the journals, you either have to be affiliated with the medical school that's paid for the um, subscriptions, um, or you have to pay for them yourself. So they're not all, all open access and free. And I think we're moving towards more open access, but that's an issue. But we have online things and, you know, Google Translate could have translated a document, you know, from French into, into English. But we're still antiquated in the sense of a lot of um, physicians are still keep paper records. And to go from doctor to doctor, you have to fax over the information. Um, so as we have to learn how to do better encrypting of, of faxing. records. Faxing? Faxing over, literally. I mean, Someone's I just life is in the balance and there's faxes literally. involved? I mean, unless you're in the same hospital but if you're going from a hospital from one hospital to, or to one doctor to another and it's about encrypted you know it's about this you know security of the patient's information but still literally yesterday I changed my daughter's pediatrician we had a fax over the vaccine information 
to the other doctor and we had to make sure it got in time and it was whole it was crazy that we're doing this in this day and age of course who has a fax machine you know so but that we need to start moving and we are like at our hospital now we're moving to get all the medical records online and have a smoother you know online system we need to be way even ahead of just online i mean mm -hmm. you need to have medical records that everything is accessible and this takes us back to genes i'm totally a proponent of the genomics that you know you go in and you have a family history. You know what genes people are carrying, what drugs they can't take because they have this gene makeup, what drugs work better in them because they have this other gene Would makeup. Would critics of it that suggest... It has nothing to do with their, their, how they look on the, on the surface. Would a critic of what you're saying suggest that having all that information about somebody could be used against them Absolutely. in some sort of Absolutely. judicial way? Because we, because we still live in a society where people are bigots and they're going to use things against people. And also, we live in a society where everything's about money. Right, because and it could make it hard to get insurance. It could make it hard to get insurance. And so it's, we, it's really a, a paradox. It's a, a big problem. I mean, in the, in the Nick, it's not just that his paper is in French. They don't want him. They have him. They have him. They don't need to translate the paper. This is not about translating right. the paper. They, they wouldn't have gone to the paper because it's in French. They wouldn't have cared about it. But, he's but now they yeah. see that this is a good procedure. They understand this is a good procedure because they have him. But they don't want to give him the benefit of doing it because they can't let him show them up. And I think that that's the ego situation, and it's very hard for people to move beyond ego. And so, you know, maybe in the next 100 years, there won't be ego, uh, and I, I we, you know, um, and there won't be all this, this money driving the world. And th so this is where we end up in the paradox of how do we have breakthroughs when we still have situations where it's capitalism and money and ego and, and bigots and racism because we've got all these countries and all these ideas and all these brains, how do we all work together and how is it not all about money? We see money in another storyline in the Nick because mm -hmm. the hospital um, is being promised uh, electricity, right? This will mm -hmm. change everything, but it comes, from a it comes as a gift from a benefactor, but it comes with strings attached. So you are confirming for me that we haven't come that far in a century. There's, you know, is that still the way it is in science today? Money, science, money, science. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, <laughs> a, you know, you can't, you can't do science without money. And it's not just the money to pay to do the science. It's also the money for all these companies that benefit from the money that is needed to carry out the science. And if I take it back to thinking about sequencing, se DNA sequencing is much less expensive than it used to be, but it's very expensive still. And there's one company that basically um, has a monopoly on it, and it's, it's inhibiting the progress. Or we have companies like DuPont that inhibit some of the research that can be done on mice because there's a patent on what's called an oncomouse. So it is so um, in the fray now, blocking at many different steps. And, I mean, the, my big, biggest benefactor is the NIH, right? But which there's is the, the, National the National Institute of Health, which funds m most medical research. And, uh, but there's a lot of strings attached. And the thing that frustrates me most is that you have to start to your t your research questions bend towards what um, they will fund, right? So uh. you know if you want to do something on that's really cutting edge and and novel, it's way harder to get funding for that. And so I think the money is dictating to an extent how the research is going, which really frustrates me. Now there are there are more you know you can go privately. Um, which, in a sense, that would be kind of these benefactor kind of models, and you know, like again, like the Allen Institute I mentioned, you know, where he's given like half a billion dollars. Um, there's now even crowd uh, funding for doing research. So the kind of cutting edge research that won't get any NIH funding or from the typical avenues, you, literally people are setting up crowdfunding, and and it's doing pretty well. But again, you still have someone to answer to. You know, now you have whatever you promised for your your funders. So there's always it's a never ending. You know, unless you're independently wealthy and can carry out this research yourself there's always someone to answer to you know which is not necessarily a bad thing but what frustrates me is that 
half the time you're not actually doing the research. You're trying to okay. figure out ways of how to get the money to do the research. And if we could somehow get around that problem, I think we'd make a lot more progress in the actual research. There are many compelling storylines in the NIC, and at the center of them all is Clive Owen's Dr. John Thackeray. Spoiler alert, we're going to discuss some specific details from the end of season one, so if you haven't seen it, consider yourself warned. Thackeray is many things and an addict. And at the end of season one, he is carted off to a treatment center for his cocaine addiction, where he is immediately offered a cheerfully labeled vial of heroin. Heroin was invented in 1895 by Heinrich Dresser. By diluting morphine with acetyls, Dresser created a substance called diacetyl morphine, and the Bayer Aspirin Company marketed it as heroin. And a hundred years later, this idea of step-down drugs, heroin for opium, methadone for heroin, still isn't working. In 2015, however, Vancouver professor Bruce Alexander experimented with rats and addictions, not in cold, ugly cages, but in happy rat habitats, and found happy rats avoided drugged water. In the NIC, we see a lot of very hard worlds. We see racism and sexism and barbaric practices and gross inequality of, of wealth and power and tragedy and sorrow and addiction. How does that compare to us now? Well, we see all those things now. Um, you know, it's just a different time, uh, different subtleties, different Is it people. is it a matter of, um, of amount? Do we see less? Less sexism, less racism, less addiction, less tragedy, less sorrow, or no? I don't know. Well, there, you know, there's, there's two different points of view on that. There's some there, there is a book that was just recently written, The Moral Arc by Michael Shermer, and, and also a book by Steve Pinker, which is saying that, that looking at the trends and looking at history, that in terms of morality, that we're, we're getting better. We're becoming more moral. We're making advances. Now, there are others that argue against that. Um, but in terms of how that relates to drug addiction, you know, obviously, and you know, there's these rat experiments show you, if you have adversity, people turn to things to escape in a way of escapism and can turn to substances like and, and abuse, abuse drugs. That being said though, um, taking the drug, even in a happy way, some people just take drugs because they wanna have fun. Maybe there's no adversity, you know? And it, then it starts to have a physiological effect on your body. So, you know, it's, it, it's about what makes you turn to the drug. But the point is, once you become addicted, whether you come from a really adverse environment um, where you're more at risk for taking drugs or a very happy environment, once the drug has a hold of your system, you, can be, you become addicted and you have to go through the same withdrawal either way. So I think, you know, obviously if we improve people's situations and circumstances, there'll be less drug addicts, but I don't think we'll ever be able to completely remove it because people want to also feel high just for the sake of, you know, having a different conscious experience. Go for a run. Yeah, right? That's what I say to people. <laughs> Meditate, you know, but um, that problem will always be there. But I think removing the adversity would be a place to start. Yeah, but we have so much poverty now. Um, you know, we're not, we're not doing better in that regard. Um, so if we think about these people who are poor, perhaps they don't have the same ability to purchase the drugs. Um, but then drugs in those communities become a way to make money. And, and so, you know, there's this vicious cycle. But I think, I mean, another interesting question that, you know, I was thinking about is that the, what, what drives people to these addictions and, and having these adverse um, and stressful kind of environments is also, you know, the doctors here who are, who are dealing with life and death are being driven to drugs as well. So any kind of stressful environment. And I was thinking, you know, in this day and age where we're, you know, residencies where people have to be up all night and the pr pressure to publish and all that kind of um, pressure. Are, are, are doctors today doing drugs to keep up and to deal with the stress and the pressure? You know, I started kind of asking myself that question and thinking about it. You know, when a surgeon has to be up, you know, in the operating room at, at you know, 6 a.m. And, and be working till 11 at night. And, you know, I've been doing research and seeing these people just getting four or five hours of sleep. Are they taking stimulants as well? I was thinking when you talked about the tragedy and the police brutality that we see in the NIC, um, when we see the police, because they're so angry about um, the, the, the black people, and they go out and they're just going to beat up all the black people 
because any of them could have been this one person who killed the police officer. So they're going to just kill them all. They're going to beat them all. And so while I say that things are better in terms of looking at the brutality and the suffering, um, you know, we're, we're in a place now where we're dealing with this whole concept of police brutality and, and the inequality of how black men are treated in our society. Um, and so, you know, you, you look at this program, and yes, while we've come a long way, we, we certainly don't have the same levels. Many of the pieces that are shown resonate now. I'm sure that we have plenty of doctors taking drugs to, to make it through medical school. We certainly have cops who are lying and who are killing black people just because they are black. Uh, you know, so there th we resonate on many levels with this program. Although it's a hundred years later, we're still doing similar things because these are things about humanity, and humanity is still having a lot of the same problems. Jill, that's about all we have time for. So thank you very, very thank much you so for much joining for us. Having me here was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you. And don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app.